quarter of 2022. Uh, first of all, uh, healthy and happy new year to everyone. Uh, as you know, uh, at least for this week, so perhaps next week, we uh, are required to host uh, colloquial and other such meetings via Zoom because of increasing, uh, you know, uh, infection of uh, the new strain of COVID. Um, the good news is you'll get uh, both the new world and the old world because our speaker has kindly agreed to actually visit in person end of uh, February uh, while giving the Zoom talk today, okay? Um, okay, our speaker today is Professor Ignacio Taboada, who's a professor at Georgia Tech, Atlanta. He's a senior member of the Ice Cube Experiment. Ignacio's original interest was in the study of cosmic rays. As these particles propagate, they interact with the background photons and particles that produce gamma rays and neutrinos. The primary focus of Ice Cube experiment is the study of high energy neutrinos, which is the current focus of Professor Tabaoda. Following his PhD, Professor Tabaoda explored possible origin of high energy neutrinos from GRBs and concluded they are not likely to be the origin of high energy neutrinos. Today, of course, we'll hear more of what he thinks is the origin of this mysterious high energy neutrinos that we, Ice Cube detects. Uh, Ignacio completed his undergraduate studies at the Simon Bolivar University, the top university of Venezuela, where only one in a hundred get admitted and arguably one of the outstanding institutions of higher education in South America. He then left to the United States and joined the graduate physics program at University of Pennsylvania. In 2002, working on the Amanda project, the predecessor of Ice Cube, he obtained his PhD. Ignacio returned to Venezuela and after two years of service, returned to the US, this time as a researcher at UC Berkeley. In 2008, he joined the faculty at Georgia Tech where he has been ever since. Ignacio, welcome uh, to the Caltech uh, Astronomy Colloquium. And uh, we certainly hope, and many young people who are interested in Ice Cube who hope to see you in person and interact with in person in your later visit in February. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, very kind uh, invitation and for the nice uh, words of introduction, Sri. Um, I will tell you today about uh, high energy neutrino astrophysics with uh, Ice Cube. And uh, let me make it very clear from the beginning that this should not be perceived as a comprehensive summary of all of the scientific output of Ice Cube or even the, the astrophysical uh, uh, science of, of Ice Cube. So let me start by um, telling you about what neutrinos are and why is that we want to do neutrino astronomy uh, with them. Um, then the, I will tell you about Ice Cube and how is that we detect neutrinos and what the backgrounds are. I will tell you about the discovery of astrophysical diffuse neutrino flux by Ice Cube, a summary of the multi messenger real time Ice Cube activities, and uh, the most recent search for point sources with Ice Cube. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the future uh, for Ice Cube uh, Gen 2. So um, let me begin with neutrinos. Neutrinos are elementary particles and they are leptons. That means that they interact weakly. And uh, because neutrinos are, are neutral particles, they do not interact electromagnetically. When I say that neutrino interactions are weak, I really mean very, very weak. Um, as an example, right now, the, the largest flux of neutrinos where you are or where I am is, is the sun. Um, the sun per square centimeter produces uh, 10 to the 10 here at Earth, uh, 10 to the 10 neutrinos per, per second. And uh, these, uh, these solar neutrinos, the, the mean free path of, of these neutrinos, these solar neutrinos is about one light year in lead. 
Oh, that is how weak that that interaction that interaction is. Now, in in Ice Cube, we're studying neutrinos that are higher energy than those produced by the sun, and the mean free path is going to be shorter, but it's still going to be gigantic compared to anything, uh, you know, dominated by say electromagnetic interaction. Um, the other thing I want you to take you from this slide is that there are three types of, of neutrinos, electron neutrino, mu neutrino, and tau neutrino, and there's actually the antiparticle for each one of them. I will be focusing in this presentation mostly on mu neutrinos and mu antineutrinos, but it's a good thing to keep in mind that the others are, are present. Since I talk about the energy scale, I will be using electron volts as my uh, energy scale very very commonly, so it's, it's good that we remember the, the energy scales in electron volts, kV, MeV, GeV, TeV, PeV, and I put as a reference there, visible through gamma ray for electromagnetic spectrum, and then I put a handful of instruments that do electromagnetic observations, for example, Fermilat conducts the bulk of its observations in GeV gamma rays, and imagine Ereshenkov telescopes like Veritas, CPA, and so on, conduct a lot of their observations roughly at one pair electron volt or 10 to the 12 electron volts. Now in the bottom part, these orange boxes, all of them correspond to sources of neutrinos that have been observed. For example, the earth, the crust, has a lot of thorium and uranium. And there's a long range of, uh, of nuclear reactions, decays, that take place because of that original thorium and, 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 and uranium in the, in the crust. And that those neutrinos have been observed. Nuclear reactors produce neutrinos. Supernovae, we should really say supernova. There's one that has been observed in neutrinos, 20 neutrinos from supernova 1987A in the large Magellanic cloud. Solar neutrinos, of course, have been observed. Neutrinos can be produced artificially um, in, in particle accelerators. Atmospheric neutrinos have been observed by multiple instruments, including Ice Cube, and you will he hear about that today. And uh, astrophysical neutrinos, which were discovered by, by Ice Cube. But I think keeping in mind these um, energy scales is also, also very useful because it tells you that Ice cube is not going to be observing, for example, uh, solar neutrinos. It's a different, uh, very different energy scale, many orders of magnitude and difference. So, so let me tell you about the connections that exist in the high energy non-thermal universe for potential uh, 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 astrophysical messengers. You can imagine trying to do astrophysics with uh, electromagnetic radiation, which is well the way the, the way that almost all astrophysics is done, um, and and as I will detail in my exit slide, a, a problem with that is that at the highest energies, the universe becomes opaque to to gamma rays. You can also try to do uh, astrophysics with um, cosmic rays, including protons. The problem is that because they're electrically charged they get bent in galactic fields and we lose the information of, of, of their original direction. Uh, neutrinos, because they're electrically charged, just like gamma rays, they travel in a straight line. And the very difficulty of detecting them, the fact that they have very weak interaction and we need gigantic detectors, then becomes an advantage because it means that they can go from one side of the universe to the other be, uh, if, if, without being without being uh, attenuated. Um, there are, broadly speaking, uh, two ways of producing uh, neutrinos. One is, uh, uh, as a summary, proton-proton uh, interactions or proton-gamma ray interactions. Uh, in both cases, it requires a particle acceleration. In, in particular, it requires the acceleration of, of hadrons, being protons or other, other nuclei. And then these, these uh, accelerated cosmic rays interact with environment um, um, uh, matter or environment uh, photon fields. 
and that interaction always result in, in the in the production of of neutral pions and uh, and and charged pions. Charged pions then decay into neutrinos, and neutral pions then decay into into gamma rays. So you see that there is a connection between the origin of cosmic rays, very high energy gamma rays and high energy gamma rays, and and neutrino. It's, it's not necessarily a one to one connection, but the three things are expected to be uh, interlinked. As I mentioned, the universe is opaque to electromagnetic radiation. And the way that that happens is if you have two photons and the two photons have an invariant mass that is larger than twice the mass of the, of the electron. In that case, an electron-positron pair is, is produced. And uh, here you have a graph that illustrates this as a function of the energy of the um, uh, of the astrophysical photon in, in in electron volts versus the distance in in megaparsecs. And you have uh, the interaction of your signal photons with, for example, cosmic infrared background light or cosmic microwave background light. And you see that if you're talking about 10 to the 15 electron volts or one PeV, uh, the, the closest distance we can study is, is only the, the center of our own galaxy. In short, we're left with neutrinos as the main messenger for the, for the highest energies. Now, this, this um, figure that I have here is somewhat complicated. Um, but it is very interesting. So I, I want to spend um, a little bit of time on it. Um, let me begin with these two color bands, one in orange and the other in blue in the center of the, of the graph. Uh, this is the measurement that has been done by IceCube of the astrophysical diffuse neutrino flux. That, and we have two bands there because the measurement has been done with two methods. We have actually done that measurement with more than two methods, but I'm just showing two methods for, for clarity. Then on the, on the right side of the figure, you have data for the highest energy cosmic rays that you see that extend all the way to 10 to the 20 electron volts, uh, almost 10 joules. Um, and then the line in green represents a potential model for a extra galactic, uh, of ultra high energy cosmic rays. And if you assume that these extragalactic sources of cosmic rays are such that the cosmic ray opacity for the cosmic rays leaving their source is approximately one, then you can show that that results in the maximum neutrino flux from that sources, from these sources. And then a calculation results in this dashed line in the center, and that is the maximum neutrino flux that you can have, assuming that uh, cosmic ray sources uh, do produce neutrinos. The flux could be lower, but it cannot be higher than that for cosmic ray sources that produce neutrinos. And, and I think it's very interesting, clearly, that uh, the approximate scale of the observations by ice cube is, is comparable to that uh, green dash line. I can also tell you a little bit of, of, of trivia, or not trivia, history. Um, when, when this prediction was made, uh, when this calculation was made of the, of the uh, upper limit on the, diff on the neutrino flux from cosmic ray sources, that was done some like 25 years ago. Uh, this level was used to justify building ice cube with the size that it currently has. We knew we needed a detector of the size that ice cube has to be able to measure a diffuse flux that is comparable to that level, which effectively we have done. So let me look now on the left side, the blue part. There you have in blue data from the Fermilab gamma ray telescope in, in Earth orbit. And this is the isotropic gamma ray background. So that is you take the Fermilab data and you subtract all the sources that can be uh, resolved. 
and you subtract the galactic diffuse background and you're left or you block it somehow and, and you're left with the isotropic gamma ray background, which is presumably composed mostly of unresolved, unresolved gamma ray sources. Now that yellow, that sorry, that uh, blue line that is dashed, that has an a spectral index of minus two point fifteen, that is the implied gamma ray, the implied gamma ray spectrum extrapolated down to lower energies, assuming that index that if you then attenuate it according to what I told you before that the universe is opaque to, to gamma rays, if you attenuate it, and not only you attenuate it, you see these electron and positron that are produced when you have the photon photo interactions, that is going to result in a cascade uh, that will produce lower energy, lower energy photons. So the high energy photons migrate to these lower energies so that's going to result into, if this is emitted like this dashed line, it's going to be observed at Earth as that solid line. So if you wanted to make neutrino observations compatible with gamma rays, then you have to have an spectrum that matches that at the sources, that dashed line that you have there. Now, um, an interesting implication of this graph is that if you have a neutrino spectrum that is softer than an index of minus 2.15, if it's softer than that, then this observed at Earth gamma ray, isotropic gamma ray background is going to grossly exceed what actually is there. So the spectrum of neutrinos, if it has to be consistent with the gamma ray observations at low energies, it has to be relatively hard. Um, and I will tell you ahead of time, our best indications right now is that the spectrum is soft enough that there will be too many gamma rays at low energies. And I will come back to this point again. We think that the sources of these diffuse flux of neutrinos have to be opaque to gamma rays, because otherwise we will be seeing a lot brighter isotropic diffuse gamma ray background than we are actually seeing right now. Um, so let me tell you then a little bit about ice cube and how is that we take neutrinos and what the backgrounds are. Um, ice cube uses the water Cherenkov technique, in this case, frozen, frozen water. Um, the idea is that you have a charged particle. The charged particle is moving through ice. And, and the speed of that particle is faster than the speed of light in, in the medium. In that case, Cherenkov radiation is produced. And uh, Cherenkov radiation is directional. There's a specific angle that depends both on the speed of the particle and the index of refraction of the medium and which this radiation is going to be produced with respect to the direction of the, of the particle. Not only that is that there's a specific uh, spectrum to this to this light, it picks towards uh, blue and and uh, on ultraviolet, so our eyes perceive it blue. And 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 this picture, in fact, is the picture of of a, a, a nuclear reactor pond that is full of water, and you have a lot of electrons from beta decays that are moving relativistically through that water, and that's the the origin of that of that blue glow that you that you see there. Now, ice is a really good medium to see this Cherenkov radiation because glacial ice, in particular the South Pole, is very, very, very transparent. I don't want to go too much details into these two graphs. I, I prefer to instead maybe focus on these numbers that are here that summarize the important properties. On the right, you have the absorption length and glacial ice at South Pole is a natural medium. It, is, it does not have uniform properties, in particular as a function of depth, the properties vary, but the absorption length goes anywhere from 100 to 200 meters. That is, ice is extremely, extremely transparent. Um, it takes, in a laboratory, extremely large, dedicated, and expensive equipment to make water 
that is, say, 50 meters absorption length. It can be done, but it is a major accomplishment. The, this uh, glacial ice at South Pole is naturally very, very pure of impurities and, and therefore very, very transparent. Now, a difficulty we have at South Pole is instead the scattering length. So there are a little bit of impurities in this uh, natural glacial ice, and these impurities will scatter the light. And the light is very forward picked. However, after so many scatterings, you effectively isotropize that, uh, that light beam and and the effective scattering length in south pole ice ranges from about 25 meters to 40 meters so you see that these will wash out some of the directional information that is present in the Schoenkorf radiation that's something that we have to live with at south pole but we, we managed to we managed to do it most important message of this slide is that neutrinos are detected via secondary charged particles and these secondary part charged particles produce Cherenkov light, and that it is very, very transparent medium to do that detection. So this is IceCube. IceCube is a, a detector that has one cubic kilometer. Um, IceCube is composed of 86 strings. You see that the glacial ice at South Pole is about almost three kilometers deep. So what we do is that we drill holes, 86 holes that are about two and a half kilometers deep. The holes are maybe 60 centimeters in diameter. The ways that they were drilled is that you inject a jet of hot water and then you let the device go down slowly. Once the desired depth is achieved, the drill is removed, the water is left in the hole, and then a cable is lowered into the hole. Uh, with digital optical modules. And these digital optical modules have a photomultiplier tube and a large area photomultiplier tube. And, and then you instrument these digital optical modules every so often over the bottom kilometer of the cable and you let it refreeze in place. You repeat that 86 times and uh, over an area of one square kilometer, then four, you have your cubic kilometer detector instrumented. The construction of IceCube was finished in December of 2010, and we have been operating in this full configuration <clears throat> since May of 2011. Um, the digital optical modules in total, there are some like 5,200. 99% of them are operational. The approximately 1% that are not operational all fail during the refreeze of the ice. Um, because of the way that the instrument operates, then IceCoop uh, works 99% of the time. Um, this is a, a number that we're, we're um, very proud of. And in a, 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 in a very perverse way, I guess because people cannot uh, fiddle around with the detector, that COVID has made our uptime even better. And over the past year, we have achieved actually all the way to 99.7% uptime or something similar to that. Then also because of the way that it operates, uh, the sensitivity of ice cube is in principle to the entire sky, four pi star radians. So we conduct an all the sky, all the time survey uh, of, the, of the sky. Our best sensitivity is actually in the Northern sky. This is something that I will tell you a little bit more about later, but in principle, we have sensitivity over the entire, over the entire sky. Um, this is a summary of the IceCube collaboration. It, it's um, uh, 54 institutions, uh, 13 countries, and uh, our author list consists of about 350, 350 people. If you count the flags, there's one flag missing and one institution missing. That's why you know it doesn't match the numbers that I that I just said because this this figure is you know a, a few months old. Um, then um, let me tell you a little bit about signals and, uh, and backgrounds. Um, we can statistically separate approximately 390 astrophysical neutrinos per year. Um, these astrophysical neutrinos appear to be isotropic, uh, which is interpreted as the 
uh, sources of these astrophysical neutrinos to be of extragalactic uh, extra origin. Um, the, on top of that, we also have significant, very significant atmospheric backgrounds. Uh, cosmic rays that arrive as, essentially isotropically at Earth, and they're proton, helium, other, they interact at the top of the atmosphere, say 10, 20 kilometers high, and they produce a shower of, of particles. Uh, most of these particles will be stopped in the atmosphere, or they will reach the ground and they will essentially stop there. Uh, however, there are some particles that will go significantly deeper into the planet. One are neutrinos. Neutrinos are among the particles that get produced here. And these are so-called, well, not brilliantly, atmospheric neutrinos. Atmospheric neutrinos, we, with ice cube, observe about uh, 100,000 100, per year. So, and they are an, a re irreducible background to our searches for uh, astrophysical neutrinos. And I will tell you a little bit later, how is that we separate astrophysical from atmospheric, uh, atmospheric neutrinos. But even worse than the atmospheric neutrinos are atmospheric muons. Um, muons are similar to an electron. They're more massive and they are relatively unique in being particularly deeply penetrating. At the energies that we care about, a muon in ice or rock will travel up several kilometers. So that means that even though ice cube is built kilometer and a half below the surface of the glacial South Pole ice, quite a few muons managed to get all the way through into the detector. So we have 10 to the 11 atmospheric muons per year. Now, the traditional neutrino astronomy way of doing astrophysics is to use the planet as a filter. Uh, muons can go down and penetrate one to 10 kilometers into the ice and rock. However, they cannot go from one side of the planet to the other. They stop before they do that. Neutrinos are the single known particle that can go from one side of the, on the planet to the other. So the most basic way of doing neutrino astronomy is to look through the planet, to look down, not to look up. And, and that means that, um, that, means that um, for South Pole, we're looking mostly at the northern sky. Um, there are multiple ways in which we detect uh, neutrinos. These are the two most basic, tracks and showers. And, and today's talk, I will be focused almost exclusively with, uh, with tracks. This is the traditional neutrino astronomy channel. You have a mu neutrino that interacts with a nucleon in the, and this the nucleon could be in the ice or it could be rock in the just under the ice and that will produce some junk and let's not care too much about what this junk is plus a muon and then this muon again because it is a deeply penetrating particle will travel a long distance so in the typical detection of a neutrino you have the detector here a neutrino interaction that happens far to one side and then the muon travels and goes all the way across the, the detector. <clears throat> in this case, I have a specific example, and this is a real event, by the way, this is a real neutrino. The, in this case, specific case, the neutrino actually interacted inside of the detector and the muon was produced and is traveling horizontally. Here, each one of these dots is a digital optical module. So you have the 5,200 digital optical modules in there. And then the color indicates time, so you can see that time is flowing from right to left. And then the size of each one of the spheres tells you the amount of light that has been observed by each one of these optical sensors. And uh, it goes from the smallest spheres that it will be one photoelectron to the largest sphere that can be hundreds or thousands of, of photoelectrons. Uh, these interaction that I put here uh, mu neutrinos plus nucleon goes to junk plus muon. I'm not caring too much about neutrino, antineutrino, positively charged muon or negatively charged muon. That is because in ICU, we cannot tell them apart. Uh, the, overwhelmingly, we can only say if it's neutrino and, and antineutrino and they look the same. So we just put them all together and, and there is, we assume equal mixtures. 
Now, the, the, the good thing about this track channel is that it is the one that can be reconstructed with the best angular uncertainty. It's about a, a, a half a degree, which for most uh, astronomers sounds absolutely horrendous. Um, but this is actually limited in part by physics and, and also in part by the fact that we're using this scattering medium, ice, as, as the way of detecting these, uh, these neutrinos. We also have this another channel, the cascades or showers. Cascades or showers, all the energy of the neutrino is deposited in a very small volume, very small compared to a kilometer scale detector. Um, and, uh, and it looks more like a sphere of light expanding. There's actually some directionality information left in there because there's no lever arm. We can tell the direction only between three and 15 degrees more or less. Uh, but they're really good about this channel. The really good thing about this channel is that the energy that is deposited in detector is light is really well correlated with the energy of the neutrino. That is unlike for tracks, because in tracks you have a detector, the neutrino tracks some way, somewhere outside the detector. And then what you see is actually a muon and you only see is what the energy of the muon is inside of the detector. You never really see the energy of the, of the, um, of the neutrino. Um, so let me now talk about the observation of the uh, um, astrophysical diff diffuse uh, neutrino flux. Uh, the original discovery was made in 2013, and it was made with a method that I'm not going to bother describing. It's not our be best method. Um, um, we uh, um, Notably, we have um, characterized the diffuse flux using both tracks and cascades. In the case of tracks, we have to limit ourselves to the northern sky. For cascades, we look and look at the four pi star radian. And the one I'm going to describe right now is the most recent result. You see that it was you know, put in the archive only a uh, uh, month and a half ago or so. Um, um, and and um, um, these two plots show two pieces of information. One is the direction of the neutrino, in particular, the cosine of the zenith angle where the zenith angle is the local coordinates of the, of the neutrino. Uh, minus one represents an event that is perfectly upgoing, so that is coming straight from the celestial North Pole. And, and zero corresponds to the uh, celestial equator, an event that is traveling horizontally in, in ice cube. And then you have the number of events, and you have a comparison of our data to our Monte Carlo, the ratio there. The data points are in black points. The solid line in black is the sum of our, all our simulations. And uh, just on top of that black is just that it's really hard to, to distinguish that is what we call conventional atmospheric neutrinos. Conventional atmospheric neutrinos are those neutrinos that are produced via the decay of pions, just like I said before, but also via the decay of kaons, which are more massive mesons, but they're, you know, being observed, nothing particularly new about them. There is a component of uh, uh, atmospheric neutrinos that are called prompt neutrinos that has not been observed. And what we have there is just a model of how they should look like, but it doesn't really matter. Um, then see in red and see in the left panel that is two orders of magnitude below the atmospheric neutrinos, we have the astrophysical, the best fit, astrophysical diffuse, diffuse flux. See that one of the informations that you have here is that, see that there's atmospheric neutrinos, you have a lot more neutrinos coming horizontally that you have coming from, from below. Um, that is because of the way that atmospheric neutrinos are produced in the atmosphere. See, however, that the astrophysical neutrinos are essentially uniformly uniformly distributed over the entire sky. Here near the horizon, you have some drop in efficiency because of the way the detector operates. And then here at the, for the steepest events, the ones that are going almost perfectly vertical, uh, these are neutrinos that are going through the densest part of the planet. They're going through the core of the planet. And a little bit of the neutrino flux is actually being attenuated by by the planet itself without that attenuation if we were correct for that attenuation these would be flat 
And then this is consistent with what I said that the flux of neutrinos is isotropic in the sky. Then you have on the right, a similar panel. You have the energy of the muon inside of the detector, number of events, same labels for astrophysical neutrinos, conventional atmospheric neutrinos, and so on. And, and see that at low energies, say one TeV, the overwhelming majority of your events are going to be atmospheric. But as you increase the energy, the spectrum of astrophysical neutrinos is harder. So somewhere around a couple hundred TeV, astrophysical neutrinos overtake at, uh, atmospheric neutrinos. So it means that energy is just by itself a good indicator of how likely a neutrino is to be astrophysical or atmospheric. The higher the energy of an event, the more likely it is to be, to be uh, astrophysical. Um, so the analysis that we conduct to search for these astrophysical neutrinos is just a two-dimensional bin, uh, two bin likelihood in which you have the number of events on each bin comparing our models to the observations. And here in this two-dimensional uh, histogram, the entry for each bin is the signal of our background for each bin, which means how likely it is that bin to be due to astrophysical origin or how it likely it is to be due to background origin, that is atmospheric, atmospheric origin. And then we just do a two-dimensional fit. And in this two-dimensional fit, we get the parameters of the uh, astrophysical flux, but then we also get parameters that are related to our systematic uncertainties. And let me just mention a little bit the sources of that uncertainties. Like I said, ice is a natural medium. The properties are not uniform. The properties are complicated. And even though we have extremely good knowledge of the optical properties of ice, and we have spent a humongous amount of time understanding the natural ice at South Pole, there is some uncertainty. And that uncertainty gets propagated into our knowledge of the astrophysical um, diffuse flux. Let me not go over all the systematic uncertainties. I don't think that's necessary at, at this time. So this is it. This is this is the, the result that we do. We um, in, we fit the spectrum as a simple power law in in energy, and uh, so then we have these two parameters: a normalization and an spectral index. The spectral index for mu neutrinos that is using the traditional neutrino astronomy channel is two point thirty seven. <coughs> I'm sorry, and and that number is by itself very interesting. Because he said that it is a, a softer a spectrum, softer a spectrum than that number that I had told you before, uh, 2.17. Um, just this result is interesting information in the fact that we expect the main source responsible, the main source is responsible for the astrophysical diffuse flux to be opaque to gamma rays. And uh, in this figure, by the way, you have the this measurement with astrophysical of, of the astrophysical diffuse neutrino flux with tracks, the traditional tra neutrino channel in the in the orange in the orange band. It goes from about 10 TeV to about 10 PeV, so it extends over uh, three orders of magnitude in energy. And then I also throw in there the measurement using cascades, an alternative method that actually looks at the four pi star radian. And in this case, it has been broken into, um, into this quasi-differential quasi flux. Very good. So I will switch gears now, and I will tell you about uh, multi-messenger and real-time in ice cube. And I think that there's people in the audience that are, uh, uh, I'm certain, quite interested about, about this topic. Um, the, uh, a real-time uh, uh, program in IceCube is very extensive. I'm only going to, to talk about the way in which we in IceCube produce alerts to send to the wider community to be followed up by the wider community. The idea, I am sure you're aware, is that if you make a multi-messenger connection, you're more likely to arrive that interesting information. So that is, if you have a neutrino that is likely to have an astrophysical origin and you find an interesting source uh, flaring at the same time, then you have probably identified a neutrino source. 
In 2016, we began reporting in real time neutrino events that we thought had a likely astrophysical origin. In 2019, that um, reporting was refined and, and streamlined. And, and we nowadays uh, have two streams of events, one that we call the gold events and the other one that we call the bronze events. Uh, gold events have a rate of approximately 10 per year, and they have an average astrophysical signalness of 50%. So it means that we expect about five of these events to be due to atmospheric backgrounds, and then the other five to be due to uh, astrophysical, astrophysical signal. And the typical energy of these events is going to be somewhere around 100 TV or 200 TV and higher. And, and then the, for the bronze channel, then we have an additional 20 events per year in which the average astrophysical signalness is about, is about 30%. And, and this um, is just a pretty picture of the very first alert that we sent uh, uh, with, with IceCube in 2016. Um, it, the analysis of these alerts is done in real time at South Pole. So from the, from the moment that the data is collected by our computers to the moment that the notice is presented to the wider astronomical community, on average, we have a latency of about, of about two minutes, which I find very impressive. Um, and, and here is our simulation of the expected median angular resolution for these alerts for the gold or gold plus, plus bronze as a function, as a function of, of neutrino energy. So you see that for the typical event, if you're talking about 100 TeV, you're talking about 0 0.3, 0 0.4 uh, uh, degree angular uncertainty. And as you go a little bit higher in energy, that improves somewhat. Um, these alerts, when they are produced at South Pole, then via Iridium satellite, we send uh, some information north really fast. That's how we managed to get the alert out in a couple minutes. The via a slightly slower uh, satellite transmission, uh, we, we send more information north and then we apply the fanciest method that we have for the uh, event reconstruction. And by event reconstruction, I mean, we want to find the best direction and the best estimate of the energy of the particle inside of the uh, of the detector. And, and here's an example of how that looks like in equatorial uh, uh, coordinates uh, for a recent alert of, uh, let me see, this was in December 16th of, of last, last year. And, and then the, the um, black contour corresponds to the 50% uncertainty region, the, the the red contour corresponds to the 90% uh, 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 region. And, uh, and, and then this is reported in a humanly written way um, a couple hours, more like four hours after each, each uh, event is reported. And, and we normally report the rectangle that abounds that, that uncertainty region. This one, by the way, is one that is particularly bad. If you look at the 50% region, this is uh, 2.6 square degrees. And, and there are reasons why that happens occasionally and that I can talk to you privately if you're, if you're so interested. Um, the most important success to date of this uh, real-time effort is, the, is a neutrino that was detected in September of 2017. Um, this is a neutrino alert that was you know, sent and we sent the circulars, same as everything that I mentioned. It had a deposit in energy of about 24 TeV, and the most likely neutrino energy is somewhere around 290 TeV. Now, the thing that this, the reason that this one is interesting is very soon after we send this alert, uh, Fermi and shortly thereafter, Magic reported that the Blazer TXS 0506-056 was, uh, was flaring in gamma rays um, simultaneous with this neutrino alert. And, and here you have, again, right ascension and declination. This is the 90% region for this event. This is the 50% region for this event. And you can see that this is very tightly reconstructed, at least for ice cube standards. And then in the background, you can see the counts in, in Fermi uh, for, uh, for GeV scale uh, uh, gamma rays. Now, um, this is just another 
pretty picture of that of that flair because it is you know there in Orion. I think it's worth showing. Um, and uh, and uh, you know TXS is a blazer. That means that you have a active galaxy, and uh, and that active galaxy has a jet, and that jet is pointing essentially towards us. We're looking down the barrel of of that jet, and we think that there's particle acceleration in that jet, and that particle of acceleration result in these neutrinos and potentially gamma rays as well that we are that we're seeing. Uh, we did a publication that included Ice Cube, Magic, Fermi, and actually a large number of instruments because there's a, a very large uh, multi-wavelength uh, campaign associated with this alert. And, and in this publication, we rule out the accidental coincidence of this gamma ray flare with uh, the neutrino at the, at the three sigma at the three sigma level. Um, because we had that alert, then we went back and looked at our own archival data and, uh, and, then, and then said, are the neutrinos uh, that are coming from TXS at other times that we did not, were not aware of? And, and here's data. You see, this is when ice could begin operating in full configuration, May uh, of, sorry, um, May of 2011. But we have data even before then because IceCube is modular and cooperate, could operate before uh, it was fully constructed. And indeed, we find that there is a flare of neutrinos, about 13 neutrinos in excess over background uh, over a period of about five months between the end of 2014 and, and the beginning of 2015. And, and, and again, this was ruled out as being due to accident with three and a half sigma significance. And, and, and one thing that I find very interesting is that in this time period, uh, TXS was actually not flaring in gamma rays. It was, it was, it was fairly quiet. And, and, and I can tell you the theorists have had a lot of difficulties, you know, making the two things work, having a period in which you have gamma rays coming out and an neutrino coming out and a period that you only have um, um, a, a, a neutrinos, neutrinos coming out. Um, and, and, you know, you have to put this in the context of what I've said before, that we expect the sources of the diffuse flux of neutrinos to be, um, to be opaque to gamma rays. Um, so you can wonder how is it that we have this source and, uh, and, 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 and that statement be consistent with each other. And I think, uh, I think that, can be, that can be thought out as, you know, blazers, gamma ray bright blazers are contributing only to a modest fraction of the astrophysical diffuse flux. And in fact, this study that is presented here precedes that TXS study. Uh, we did a correlation between blazers in the two lac catalog and, uh, and our neutrinos. And, uh, and we find, let's focus on this blue band here. This blue band represents the uh, upper bound on how much uh, neutrinos can contribute from these two lac uh, blazers. Whereas here in the gray band, you have the diffuse astrophysical uh, flux. And this results in that uh, gamma ray light blazers can contribute no more than about 27% of the astrophysical diffuse flux. So, you know, at least in that respect, things we manage to synchronize. Um, so um, there's a, um, a work that has been done, and this is work that has, you know, in which uh, Caltech has major take a major initiative related to tidal disruption events. This is not work that has been done by IceCube. So, so CTF, Tricky Transient Facility, has a, a program in which they follow the alerts that we produce, the alerts that I was telling you, uh, telling you about. And CTF had already discovered a tidal disruption event in April of 2019. Uh, these tidal disruption events happen when we get a star that passes too close to a black hole and the star is uh, destroyed you know, you get nothing left there, it's just scattered around. And, and, uh, and uh, um, this neutrino was found by CTF to be in coincidence with their uh, uh, TDE, uh, but um, somewhere 150, 200 days after the start, uh, the start of, the, uh, of the TDE. And, and they have published that the accidental co co uh, correlation of this uh, TDE with this uh, alert is, um, is ruled out of somewhere between 0 0.2 and 0.5% uh, uh, level. And, and, um, 
Um, actually, there is a newer uh, newer alerts. Uh, actually, it's it's two more alerts and two more TDs. I'm sorry, I don't have the information correctly here. I only have one here. Well, there's two actually additional alerts and two additional TDs that are for a total of three that are potentially correlated with TDs or or or, or candidate or candidate TDs. And and uh, and, and Robert Stein, who is a postdoc beginning just here, uh, here at Caltech with you. Um, he, he had a study initially and we looked at all the neutrinos um, and tried to do a correlation of uh, his catalog of TDEs with our catalog of neutrinos. And he found that the astrophysical diffuse flux, no more than 39% can, uh, can be due to TDEs. But this is, this is an area that I hope the near future will see uh, a, a more elaborate a more elaborate and 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 higher statistics study. Um, so um, I'm actually running a little bit slow, um, but I think I will be fine if I want to finish in say five minutes. I want to tell you a little bit about the time integrated point source search. Um, I would I will do that. I will skip maybe a slide or two. So we have all the neutrinos that we collect. That I say is a hundred thousand uh, per year. Here's the northern sky. In the southern sky, let's ignore that for a moment. Um, let's only concentrate in the, in the northern sky. We have uh, these atmospheric neutrinos. And we can look for point sources by looking for clustering of neutrinos in a specific direction. But also, we can add uh, the energy information. Because the higher the energy, the more likely it is for the neutrinos to be astrophysical compared to uh, the atmospheric, the atmospheric background. So use those two pieces of information, energy and direction, and and then decide if you have a a, a point source. And this this is a figure that I made for only ten thousand events of a public data set. You can download it there if you're so inclined. Uh, and I put only ten thousand for clarity. Um, so you can go and then do a method in which for each point in the sky you calculate what is the p-value, the local p-value of there being a neutrino source compared to the uh, background only hypothesis. You can do that for the northern sky. You can do that for the southern sky. But like I said, I'm going to ignore the southern sky for now. And this is the location of the most likely northern sky hotspot. And because you're looking at a lot of spots in the sky at the same time, they have a gigantic trials factor. And, and the, and the post-trial p-value, once you take into account all those trials, is actually nothing to write home about. But let's keep this, let's keep this hotspot in mind because we have done this study another way, which is that we predefine a list of sources that we think are interesting. And this list of sources contain things like blazers, but they also contain other types of active galaxies. They contain starburst galaxies. They contained uh, several types of galactic sources and so on. In total, we have 110 sources over the entire sky that we say that are interesting for one reason or another. And this hottest spot in the northern sky happens to be right next to NGC 1068. And then when we conduct not the study over the entire sky, but correlated with this source list, we find that NGC 1068 has a post-trial p-value of, of 2.9 sigma which is to date our best uh, time integrated point source analysis, uh, sorry, hotspot. So 1068 is a very nearby 14 megaparsecs away. Starburst galaxy is the prototype uh, Cipher II uh, a galaxy. And let's assume for a moment that it really is a neutrino source. So this is the implied neutrino spectrum. And then here in red, you have the Fermi uh, gamma ray, the Fermi gamma ray of a spectrum. And then in blue and in black, you have the uh, spectrum as measured by, uh, by Fermi and, and, and MAGIC. Actually not measure, they have put uh, upper limits. So you see that where we see neutrinos, there are no very high energy gamma rays. And at this distance, the universe is not opaque enough. We should be seeing these very high energy gamma rays if they were being emitted from NGC 1068. And if you compare this level for neutrinos to the Fermi level, you can see that the neutrinos are extremely, extremely bright. And again, if you think about the idea of neutrino sources being um, being opaque to gamma rays, this is consistent uh, with that uh, with that with that picture. 
so okay so let me spend the last minute talking about ice cube gen 2. um ice cube gen 2 is a planned uh, next generation uh instrument it will be co-located with ice cube also at south pole approximately the same depth but we're looking at instrumenting an, a volume that is going to be about eight times that of ice cube we're going to use in be using newer instrumentation and and take advantage of all the adva improvements in electronics since the early 2000s and is going to have an order of magnitude more astrophysical neutrinos being detected uh, at the rate of being detected and then five times better sensitivity to point sources and i don't have time to prove this but we have you know uh, proof of this that any any population of neutrino sources that has been uh, postulated as an, a reasonable explanation of the diffuse flux is detectable by ice cube gen 2. So let me just stop and take, take your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, let your clap. Um, questions, um, please uh, raise your hand uh, and I will, uh, um, you know, uh, I'll get you in the order that you raised your hands. should be able to see this. I should? Uh, well, okay, Fiona Harrison. Hi, that was a, a really nice talk. I'm, I'm wondering, um, I'm always a little bit, the different reports I've read about the probability of association with the blazar and the neutrino vary quite a bit. And I'm wondering, is it surprising that there aren't other associations with other blazars if this is real? So um they try to do that analysis? On 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 the first topic, you would you need to be more specific for me to be able to comment. Um I mean the the three sigma and the three and a half sigma come straight from the um citations I provided, but I'm happy to take that at some other point with you. Um so why no more blazers? So so um so you saw that we put a limit on the population of, of gamma ray blight lasers as contributing to the diffuse flux. So they should not be uh, contributing uh, uh, dramatically. Um, there is a publication from by K. Randish and Halsen of 2019, an update letters, um, that they show that if you want blazers to fully account for the astrophysical diffuse flux, you need them to, to flare um, you need that population to flare once you need 10% of the blazers to flare once every 10 years with the same luminosity as a uh, TXS. And then once you take those numbers and you throw them into your calculations, uh, it should be very infrequent that we get uh, um, detections like that of TXS. So if you believe that calculation by Kirandish and, and Halsen, no, it's not. It's not as strange that we have not seen more blazers. Okay, thanks. Okay, other questions? Okay, while uh, people are thinking about this, I have a, uh, once you asked a question and it's answered, please uh, lower your hand so I don't get confused. Um, I had a, a couple of technical questions. Um, you, do you use photomultiplier tubes uh, in the current system? Correct. Um, so we use uh, ten-inch uh, photomultiplier tubes. They're you know very large. Yeah. So in the new system, uh, now these photomultiplier tubes have a generally a fairly low quantum efficiency, even as you go in the blue. Is there any plans to go into some semiconductor de detectors? So probably no. Um, if you want to go for large area large area and, and the photo collection area in the eyes because it's so sparsely instrumented in volume really matters a lot if you want large area it is really really hard to beat a pmt the only reasonable alternative that i've seen that is comparable to a pmt is a so-called hybrid pmt in which you have a photocathode and then you have a silicon pm instead of the traditional dynode structure However, those, as far as I know, do not exist in large, in large production. But if you think about just a straight silicon PMs, they're just too small to get the photocathode area. That right. So, 
uh, yeah, uh, sorry, but what is the size of these cathodes in millimeters? Uh, so, so you're talking about uh, um, 25 cent, uh, let me see, uh, yeah, 25 centimeters? Yeah, so uh, nine centimeter by nine centimeter, we have, you know, already we can, that's, that's uh, the, 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 this is already possible. So if you abut them, okay, uh, it's possible, it's expensive. Uh, don't want to say it will be expensive. Uh, so for example, ZTF, we have uh, 16 detectors and our total silicon area is 1100 square centimeters. Uh, it costs a lot, but anyway, it's, uh, uh, if one can mass produce this is possible. Okay, other questions? Aranga. Yeah, my question was about the spatial resolution. Uh, as you move towards the next generation ice cube, uh, what is the limitation on improve, improvement of the spatial resolution? Is there, uh, will the error bars shrink with the next generation facility or are they going to be about the same? When, when you say spatial resolution, you mean uh, angular? Yeah, so how localized to, yes. within, I mean, you're showing error circles of a few, you know, fraction of a degree. Yes, it will improve. It will improve, and, By and how much? Uh, so um, so depends on the energy. At, at approximately one TeV, uh, the uncertainty is dominated by the angle between the outgoing muon and the neutrino. So that is imposed by physics. So that's not going to change. And we're talking about order a degree at a TeV scale. If you look at our angular resolution, it it does not follow does not fall as fast as a function of energy as it could. And 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 in fact is in, in fact is because of you know we could add more instrumentation. Um, so with uh, with uh, Gen two we could get all the way down to maybe 0.1 degrees at 100 TeV one PeV. So you know a significant improvement over the um, existing angular resolution. In fact, part of the improvement in so sensitivity to point sources uh, for Gen two comes not only from bigger size, but also from improved angular resolution for these higher energies. I see. Thank you very much. Um, other questions? So I, have, I have maybe a naive question. So Go it ahead. sounded like you were arguing that blazars and TDEs are not contributing the vast majority of, of the neutrinos. I so think is, I'm arguing that, yes. So you might expect, you know, naively you might expect one source to dominate one type of source. Yeah. Um, are there other candidates? You know, the Seiferts or supernova remnant? What are the other candidates? I, that Seiferts would be my best bet right now, but it's too early to say anything definitive. What What is the argument in favor of Seiferts? Um, so, um, I guess, I guess the fact that they are, um, are so common makes it really easy. And GC 1068 is, you know, around the corner, um, compared to TXS 0506, 056, that has a ratio of like 0.33 or something like that. Um, and, um, so just one over distance square, you win quite a bit, um, in being able to detect the sources that is, um, then, then also, also um, you have mechanisms for producing neutrinos um, um, in the corona of, of these ciphers that have been predicted for, I don't know, 40 years. Um, and the, the idea is that you have a, a magnetic reconnection um, near the, in, in, in the corona region, and then you get a particle acceleration and 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 uh, out of there you get the neutrinos. Um, I don't know if that's enough to answer your question. Yeah, I just want a basic picture. Thanks. Okay, Ranga, do you have another question? Yes. So that I mean, which class of sources dominate the astrophysical neutrino flux depends on the generation mechanism, right? So are you, are, is the hypothesis that most of the neutrinos are coming from relativistic shocks in the vicinity of AGN? Because yes, if that's the case, then I can imagine that 
um, the integral over the AGN population could account for a larger fraction of the uh, a large fraction of the astrophysical neutrino background. But do you do you, I mean do you have a hypothesis that all the neutrinos are coming from relativistic shocks uh, just in the vicinity of supermassive black holes? That that remains to be proven, right? I mean the, the yeah. observations don't tell you anything right now. Um, 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 but but in principle, the the association of of shocks and neutrino production that's that's like a the the most standard one of the most standard assumptions, right? Um, but it's not necessarily unique. Yeah, everything. Makes I, I know, I know, I know. It. I didn't give you an answer. It's just that we really don't know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Um... Well, it's a young subject, there are a lot of possibilities. So um, uh, thanks very much. Uh, Fiona, is that a question or a? Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, one more quick question. So I heard it stated that Ice Cube Gen 2 will have the capability to uh, resolve the diffuse uh, emission into sources. And I'm wondering if you can give me the best reference for that because it's, I've always found it confounding if we don't know what the sources are and what the number density is, how we know that. Okay. So, um, so uh, there's a publication by Muras and Waxman in 2016. I think it's a physics review D that goes into some of the details of that calculation. Um, so um, because we have observed a diffuse flux, then you can establish a correlation between the characteristic luminosity of the sources in neutrinos and the characteristic uh, local density of, of sources. They're inversely proportional to each other. And then, and then not only that is that because we have not identified a neutrino point source at five sigma, then that also sets a constraint in that plane of number density versus, um, uh, versus luminosity. And, and that plane is, that, that constraint is different than that, the one, the constraint set by the diffuse. Now, you can take that, that then populate that, you can populate that um, a plane uh, with uh, a predicted properties for the various uh, populations, say, you know, uh, GRBs or a place or, or whatever you want. And then you can put the expected sensitivity for Gen 2 and essentially everything is covered for uh, for Gen two, um, but yeah, I hope that that reference is enough for you. Yeah, okay, no, that that that's what I'm looking for. Thank you. Okay, so uh, that this ends the colloquium. Now I would like to, uh, faculty uh, to please uh, stay on uh, if you want to do a meet and greet. Uh, with